Um, so I really like flying e -war. This is part of why I started taking over this class. One of the things I don't really like is that a lot of times beforehand, we were just giving you guys as new players the e -war and saying, hey, go out, try it, have fun, join the fleets, without any real direction of how it works or what to do. And so I noticed that a lot of people were feeling like a lot of people saying things in the chat like, well, I'd go on the fleet, but all I can bring is just an e-war. Bring it. <laughs> I am telling you guys right now, especially if it's the only thing you can fly, but anytime, e-war makes a huge difference in our engagements and our fleets and our fights. We won the huge battle in 9 tac l because of e-war. Uh, we have been able to scrap with nightmare fleets in Ferox's because of e-warships, because of those little crucifiers, because of things like that. So, uh, that's that's really kind of where I want to get you guys excited and give you a feeling that you're not just coming in an e-war. If you're coming in an e-war on any fleet, pretty much anywhere in any corporation, you're probably going to have an impact and you're going to be useful and you're going to be helpful. And the class is really to help teach you how to do so. The next, this slide here, we're looking at the agenda, um, what we'll learn, how to be useful and how to be impactful in an e-war frigate. Uh, because, let's face it, you don't want to just go out on a fleet and kind of be there. You want to make a difference. You want to be useful. You want to have fun. Otherwise, why are you there? And e-war is a great ship for doing that in. We'll talk about the different types of e-war, the important skills to train, and how to fly your e-war in fleets. Uh, we will be going through a lot of information, and I don't usually catch questions while I'm presenting. So if you have a question or a thought, put it in a notepad document or something like that so you'll remember it. And then at the end of the class, I'll ask for questions. You can, you can go over it. Also, that way, if I answer your question in the course of the class, you don't have to ask it. But if, if it doesn't if I don't answer it, or something I said is not clear, I definitely want you to feel free to ask. Now we're going to look, first thing we're going to look at here, obviously, is the types of EOR, the modules themselves. And we're just going to go really fast through a lot of this, because we're going to talk how to use them in more in de depth uh, in different points. But the MR use tracking and guidance disruptors, which use scripts to uh, can be so they can be specified uh, further. but the tracking and guidance disruptors are shown here. You've got tracking, which is this first one with this little blue uh, fork thing. <laughs> um, and then the guidance disruptors is next to it. Tracking affects, affects gun turrets. Guidance affects missile turrets. The Caldari use ECM or jams. We will definitely go into a little more detail on that because it's got a little more detail involved to how to use them properly, but that's okay. They're, uh, they're very effective. Mimitar use target painters, and the Galente use sensor dampeners, which also use scripts to help specify um, which of two things they affect. And we'll, again, we'll go into more detail on what each of them do as we go. The Amar ships. This is, of course, the Amar ships. Now, we're only talking about the frigates here, they're all, and we're only talking about the T1s. Uh, this is only the 101 Amar uh, class. There are much higher versions, there's T2 versions of the ships, there's cruiser versions, so on and so forth. And if you find you really enjoy flying e war definitely something to look towards skilling up and using. They are very useful, especially in small game frigate roams and things like that. But you have the Amar use the Crucifier, Caldari use the Griffin, Mimitar use the Vigil, and the Galente use the Mollus. Now, you notice that we have a different color around each frame of the ship. These colors are actually important, and we'll go into that in a little more detail when we talk about the Griffin and Jams. But just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. That those Notice that the color border also affects the background of the ship. It's, it's the same color there, uh, or close to it. Green for the, the Galente, blue for the, the uh, Caldari, gold for the Crucifiers, and red for the Vigils. Now we're going to start talking in detail about specific ships. So starting off with the Crucifier, uh, this is a very purpose-specific ship. 
so looking at the uh, uh, the crucifier, it uses like we we spoke about the tracking disruptors and the guidance disruptors. Tracking disruptors only affect turrets. So this means hybrid, laser, or projectile turrets. If you use a tracking disruptor on a ship that doesn't have one of those, it will have absolutely no impact at all. Now, uh, they use scripts, but if you ha they still also work if unscripted. Um, a script is not like most ammo, even though you load it like ammo, it is not ever used up. So you don't have to go buy, you know, 40 or 50 of them and stick them in the hold. You only need one per uh, disruptor that you have fit to the ship. Uh, so the, the kind of the default fit for most crucifiers is three disruptors. So you only need three range disruption ter uh, scripts and three tracking disruption scripts. We'll talk about that more in a little bit in detail in a moment. Guidance disruptors work exactly the same, except they affect missiles. Now, this applies to uh, all missile turrets, including rockets and torpedoes. It does not, however, affect bomb launchers. So any of the others, it, they will affect, they won't affect bomb launchers. Um, one of the main tactics that EWAR is used for a lot of times in fleets is to disrupt enemy logistics or the ships that repair other ships. You can't do that in the crucifiers. Crucifiers are all about affecting the enemy DPS because that's really all you can affect with this ship. Uh, going back to the scripts a little bit, if you have no script in a disruptor, it will affect both the uh, range and the tracking of the ship that you disrupt, but it will do so to a lesser degree. If you put a script in, it will affect one of those two. It will stop affecting the other, but it will affect that one to a much greater degree. Um, a very common tactic will be to use the range disruption scripts to force your enemies to come in closer to fight so they can't be kitey um, and running away. This can make them very useful also in standing fleets. So if you're defending against people who are... Uh, trying to tackle your friendly ships, you can go out in a crucifier if you know um, that they've got guns or missiles, whichever they have fit. You can go out there and you can kind of stop them from being able to shoot your your friend unless they get in really close. Uh, the tracking aspect of the scripts or the disruptors means that they their damage applies less. Um, this is pretty big. For turrets, even bigger, I think, for missiles. Um, what it basically means, and it's kind of hard to see an impact on it right off the bat, it can be very subtle, but if you've ever shot someone in the game or shot at anything in the game, you see lots of times you'll get a glancing blow or a direct hit or a critical hit, so on and so forth. If you're being tracking disrupted, chances are you're only going to be getting glancing blows. And that can make a big difference. You figure you've got 10 uh, crucifiers in a fight, and each one of them is tracking, disrupting three enemy DPS ships. That's 30 enemy ships that aren't applying their full damage and can't apply their full damage. So which one you'll use will usually depend on your FC, uh, and, but most commonly you'll be using the ranged ones to force Kaidi ships to come in and, and fight where you want them to. Next we go look at the Kaldari E-War. This one's going to have two separate slides because it actually has a lot involved in knowing which jam to fit. Using the jams is easy. Knowing which one to fit is where it takes a bit of, of uh, foreknowledge. So the Kaldari Griffin uses ECM target jammers or jams as they're commonly referred to in the game. And uh, They affect the ship's targeting. They don't affect modules specifically. They actually affect the ship itself. So when they apply, that ship loses all targets. They cannot target anything for 30 seconds, and anything they already had targeted is unlocked. Um, you will know if you've ever been affected by a griffin or by a jammer. Uh, if you've ever had to deal with Garista's rats, they like to do that to you, and it's very frustrating. Um, 
because you're like, oh yeah, I got him, I got him. Wait, why, why, why don't I have anything locked? No. <laughs> uh, it's all. It's the most commonly used from what I've seen. E war, um, and really, really effective. It does, however, have some of its own limitations. It only has a percentage chance of a set of success. Now, all of the other e war modules will apply. Always. If you hit someone with it, they're apply it's applied to them. A jammer has a percentage chance every cycle to jam an opponent. It's basically going against their sensor strength. And even if they have super great sensor strength and super great sensor strength skills, you still have a chance of jamming them. It, it's it's amazing, and you will probably hear and see lots of uh, experienced pilots and big ships crying about griffins <laughs> or jams or pretty much any e-war. It's a very good way to farm salt. Uh, when you can have someone in an alpha account that's you know a day old come out and shut you down so that his buddies can take you out, it's a little frustrating. At the same time, it's one of the great things about Eve because there's a counter to everything, and there's – a way for everyone to have an impact and have fun. You don't have to be, you know, a five-year veteran of the game in order to be able to have an impact in a big fight in a big fleet or a small fight in a small fleet. Then we get into what's kind of the difficult part of the Griffin and, and really where knowing what your enemies are flying and knowing how to identify enemy ships can become very important. They use five different types of jams. So the one that is shown here is the multispectral. That's just a – it affects everything. Now, the multispectral – you'd think, oh, wow, the multispectral affects everything. Why don't we just always use that? There's a couple reasons for that. The multispectral has a shorter range than the other jammers. It also has a jam strength of two. Um, this only – these strengths are only – relative to the other jammers. Don't try to apply them to versus sensor strength because they won't match up. But uh, So a multispectral jam has a two sensor strength versus every type of ship. The other jams, which of which they are radar, gravimetric, lidar, and magnometric, uh, and they're here showing you on this screen, uh, these guys uh, have a three sensor strength against one type of ship and a one against all the others. So they can still affect other ships, just not as, as strongly. But they have a better range. And as we'll talk about a lot more once we get to that point, range is everything in an E-War frigate. It is how you stay alive. So when we remember when I said earlier that those colored borders around the ships would be important? Um, this is what I'm talking about. Those colored borders match. So if you notice, the radar is a goldish yellow color, and the background of Amar ships is a goldish yellow. Uh, the border that was in that previous slide was yellow or gold. Radar jams apply best against Amar ships. Uh, the example ship we've got showing here is an Augurer, which is a logistics ship very often, um, although the Augurer Navy issue looks much the same. Then you have gravimetric, which is the Caldari, which is blue. Magnetometric, which is some weird teal that I think really should be more green, but that's just me. <laughs> uh, that affects Galente. And the Ladar, which affects Minmatar and, and is red. The reason I mentioned the backgrounds is because if you're not sure, say, you know, okay, the enemies are coming in a ship that you haven't seen that often or you don't know what it is. If you right-click on that ship name or you go look up the sh that ship in the, uh, the ship tree, it will have a background when you do show info on it of that color. Uh, if you're in space and you click on a target and it shows the ship, um, that background will show the color. That will help you know which one you can apply to. Uh, this can be kind of useful, especially if, let's say you're out there in a, in a Griffin and you've got three LADAR jams, but most of the enemy ships are Kaldari, but they happen to have a couple sites there, which is what this ship shown in the picture is that I just clicked off of. Uh, <laughs> uh, that scythe is usually used for logistics and healing, 
and you can if you look at that ship in space and click on it, you see the background color of that ship is red. You're like, oh, okay, this is the one I can affect best, so I'll I'll get him. Uh, how you use the jams is a little different. We'll actually go over that more when we get to uh, the end after we've talked about all of the ships. Now we're going to look at the Mollus, the Galente Ewar. It uses sensor dampeners. Um, like the other three, other than jams, it has a 100% success rate, so if you hit somebody, it's affecting them. Um, they unscripted, they reduce range, and increase target lock time, which is referred to uh, by, by increasing, or de sorry, scan resolution is a term that we're going to mention here. Scan resolution is basically how fast you can lock a ship, and usually the size difference between ships has an effect on that, or, for example, a dampener can have a, uh, an effect on that. If you use scripts on it, you can focus to one or the other. Scan resolution is an absolutely amazing uh, script to use if you are affecting enemy logistics in a fleet. And the reason for that is it makes them take longer to lock targets. If you've ever flown a logistics ship, you have to lock your ally before you can put reps on him to repair his ship. If you have to take longer to lock him, then he's taking damage for longer. And the other team has a better chance of killing him before you can land reps. That's where that comes into play. The range disruption scripts work just like the crucifiers. It lets you control the distance of the engagement. It shuts down Kaidi people because they can't shoot somebody from range because you've reduced their targeting range. Pretty basic on that one. Uh, the Vigil. The Vigil is kind of the odd duck in the group. Um, the Vigil doesn't make it harder for the enemies to affect you. It actually makes it easier for you and your allies to affect the enemy. They use target painters. Um, target painters work kind of like they do in real life. For to, They make things easier to hit, easier to uh, see. What they do also in the game is they increase the signature radius. Like we were talking about scan resolution. Um, how fast you lock an enemy is affected by how big of a signature radius the enemy has. Certain actions in the game will increase your signature radius, like using a micro warp drive. If you're paint, target painted, your signature radius becomes bigger. That means all of your enemies can lock you faster. All of, all of their damage applies better, especially missiles. Um, missiles do more damage, or the amount of damage that a missile does is based on your signature radius, which is why you know big missiles really don't do that much to little frigates or things like that because they don't have a big signature radius unless they've activated a micro warp drive when they shouldn't have. These are super useful, make a big difference in fights, and can, can really help, especially if, say, you're in a cruiser or battleship fleet and there's a bunch of frigates trying to mess with you. Uh, if you have vigils with you or a ship fitted with target painters, you can make it a lot easier for those big ships to hit the little ships and, and stop them from harassing you. Next, we look at the important skills. Um, if I'm going too fast, you guys let me know. Uh, hopefully not. Um, there's a lot of info when it comes to this, and I just want to make sure you guys know what's going on. <laughs> uh, so, important skills for EWAR. You've got your skill category of electronic systems. What that means is if you click on your character sheet in the game, or that little icon on the side, and then click on the tab that says skills, you will see a whole bunch of things up there at the top, you know, spaceship command, navigation, so on and so forth. If you click the one that says electronic systems, Every single one of the E-War skills are in electronic systems, so you know where to go to to look at. Um, they all are you are focused by the attributes intelligence and memory. What that means is if you do a, a neural remap or if you uh, are trying to put in implants just for those specific skills, you know most of us try to get a full range of training implants, but this is just so you know what, what's important. Intelligence and memory are the two attributes that most affect how fast you will learn EWAR skills. 
this really won't matter for starting out, but if you find out you really enjoy E-War and you want to really get those skills built up, you might want to look at using a neural remap and putting most of your points into intelligence and memory so that you learn these skills faster, especially for the higher levels of them. Um, the early levels of them really won't have a big difference because they're pretty fast and easy to train. But if you're trying to train, you know, Electronic Warfare 5 or something like that, it can really, really make a difference. So the two that affect all four types of E-War are frequency modulation and long distance jamming. Obviously, if you're going to do a lot with E-War, you want those two trained first and highest. Those should be your primaries. For crucifiers, they use the weapon destabilization and weapon disruption skills. Griffins use the electronic warfare and signal dispersion. Uh, vigils use signature focusing and target painting. And molluscs use sensor linking and signal suppression. Not really going to go into detail about what each one does. If you actually go into the skill tree and uh, highlight them, it, they'll tell you exactly what kind of uh, effects they may they, they have, um, and you, you can go from there. Now we get into the real meat of the class. This is where there's a lot of information. Um, how to fly with a fleet, fleeting up. And the first rule of any fleet is read the message of the day. I don't care if you're in Pandemic Horde, the Goons, Test, wherever you are. Read the message of the day. Almost every single FC, will, especially if they're any good, will have a message of the day that says, you know, what doctrine ships they're using and, and a whole bunch of information about what's going on with that fleet. If your question is answered in the message of the day, you don't have to ask it. You don't have to, to pester anybody. You're good. If it's not answered, that's when you want to start um, asking questions. Uh, some of this that I'm gonna, information I'm going to give you guys here is very specific to Pandemic Horde because of how we have things set up. I don't know how it's done in other fleets or other corps, so I apologize if it's not the same in yours. But uh, Pandemic Horde has a group of people called NBIs or New Bean Initiates. Um, our entire purpose is to do classes like these, help people do things, answer questions for fleets, for ops, for just regular gameplay, so on and so forth. And there will generally be one of us in every wing of a fleet, um, every aspect of a fleet. There'll be at least one, if not a bunch of us there, to answer questions. So the second rule of fleet is to ask an FC, the FC or an NBI these questions before you undock. Much harder to answer a question after the fleet is undocked because things are happening, things are going, things are doing. Before you undock, it's much, much easier to, uh, to get these questions answered. Some basic questions to ask, hey, what's the preferred E-War? What E-War does the FC want to bring if they haven't put that in the message of the day? Uh, if they say, and, and part of, a big part of this is you may have an E-War wing in the fleet. So you may have a whole bunch of people working together as E-War. And you want to try and bring the same E-War if you're doing that so that whoever's wing commander of those E-War ships can say, all right, I know we all have such and such general move speed we have such and such range on our, our our disruptors or our jams so on and so forth and it can make a big difference for positioning that said a lot of times if you are e-war in a fleet you are not anchoring on someone you are solo flying you are flying yourself you are putting yourself in the correct position we'll talk about that a little bit more going forward but it still makes a difference. Always ask which E-War is preferred for the fleet, and if you can fly it, fly it. If you can't, don't hes don't be afraid to ask, say, hey, FC or NBI, I can't fly Crucifiers, but I can fly a Vigil. Is that okay? 90% of the time, they're going to say yes. Um, small frigates, especially E-War frigates, bring almost nothing negative to a fleet. <laughs> They're almost the only time I'm gonna say that most people would say no to you bringing an E-War on a fleet is if it's say a bomber fleet or a cloaky ops fleet, then they might not want you to bring that, and that's fine. Most fleets, however, the FC is gonna be like, oh hey, you're gonna bring me some E-War, rock on, bring it, which is a big part of why I do this class and why I get people in them. So they can, they have something they can bring to a fleet that makes a difference regardless of skill level. Uh, for ECM, you're going to want to ask what color jams should I bring? You know, should I, you know, multispectral, uh, 
radar, radar, what? The FC might have a good idea of what is most likely they're going to be going up against. So they can give you, without you know giving away important intel or anything like that, they can tell you, yeah, bring LADAR, or hey, fit two RADAR and one LADAR. And that's just a good way to have know what you have going forward. If they're not sure, if they say fit whatever, um, a lot of people like to do what they call rainbow. So if you have only three that you can fit, you pick three of those colors, one of each, and bring them. If you uh, in a, are in a bigger... Uh, you worship and you can fit four then you bring one of each that's something that you can do most of the time however you'll get a specific uh, specific one if you're using standing fleet if you're responding a standing fleet to help people who have been tackled or something like that in that case I suggest having one that's just fit with multi spectrals um, while they do not give you as much range you know they're shorter ranged or whatever they're going to be much more likely to be of, of use because you're not usually going to know what's on somebody right off the bat when you're trying to warp out to them and trying to refit before getting there takes a lot of time away and usually for someone being tackled in a friendly system uh, such as miners or riders or whatever you need to get there fast if they're wanting cruise fires make sure you know whether they want missile disruptors or turret disruptors most of the time for us, it's been turret disruptors, but you never know. It's always a good thing to ask. Um, now, this last is kind of a question you normally will ask yourself if you can tell. If you can't, it's something you should ask either the E-War Wing Commander um, or FC or something. And I would say ask this question in a I am. I, I really hesitate to say that because I don't want you to I am your FCs most of the time. If you have an NBI or a wing commander, absolutely ask them directly, you know, in that channel. But don't put it on comms. Don't ask it out there for everybody. You need to know how many vigils are in a fleet if you're bringing a vigil, especially bigger fleets. You know, if there's 10 or 20 vigils can make a big difference how you use it. If there's 20 vigils in a fleet, you do not need all 20 people painting whoever the FC calls as a primary target. You're going to have five people put, you know, painters on that one target and everybody else uh, can sow confusion, paint everybody else on the field. And it's like, well, if nobody's shooting at them, what's the point? Is a good question. The point is you're probably making people panic. If you are flying in a fleet and someone paint to hit you with a target painter, your first response is to immediately broadcast for reps. Well, let's say you have 20 vigils. Each of them have two target painters on them. All of a sudden, 40 people in an enemy fleet get painted. Their broadcast for reps channel is going to blow up, and the, uh, the logistics are going to implode and go, ah, I hate you all, <laughs> which is kind of the point. That's what you're supposed to do in E-War is <laughs> make your opponents go, ah. Yeah. Um, Marchog, yes. So the, the amount of time that a jam applies is exactly the same, whether it's multispectral or racial specific. Um, it's 30 seconds. I believe it might be improved by certain skills. I'm not for sure. But generally speaking, it's 30 seconds. Um, and that brings us to kind of a, another thing about how to use you – know, talking about tactics when we're, when we're talking about jams, and I'll come to that uh, in a moment. The first tactics that are important because they are across the board, it doesn't matter which E-War you are flying, um, is how to stay alive. Um, you're in a little tiny frigate that really doesn't have much armor on it for the most in most cases. Um, your defense is running away. Your defense is being outside of range where they can't even hit you. So there's a couple things you obviously want to do to make sure you keep those defenses as, as much as possible. The first is when you actually start engaging an enemy fleet or target or you know structure, whatever it is, disable your fleet warp. You do not want to be warping with the fleet. Unless you have an E-War wing and the E-War wing commander tells you otherwise, you should disable your fleet warp. A uh, big part of this is if any of you have been in a big combat yet, uh, and for those of you who have not, you'll see it eventually. A lot of times what happens is the fleets are warping in and out trying to get good position on each other. The position for the DPS 
is not the position you want to be in as an E-War. You want to be outside of that range. And you have better range most of the time um, to be able to hit enemies. So if you're warping in with your whole fleet at zero on an enemy because they want to get in and brawl, you're dead. You're done. You, you, you know, they, they're going to lock you and blap you like that. And you're going to be a high-priority target in any warship because you make such a difference in the fights. Um, so it's definitely something to pay attention to and be aware of. If you're not sure how to disable fleet warp, if you're in a fleet right now and you have your fleet window open, and I'm going to do it myself just kind of make sure I'm looking at the same thing, the little bar, a series of like four bars on top of each other up in the top left of the screen – if you click on that, there's a thing that says flag exempt from fleet warp. That's what you do once you're at a destination, once you're you know actually fighting someone. Don't do it, obviously, on the way to the, the, the destination because you want to stick with the fleet. Again, you know, you're a little small, easily blapped. You don't want to be left alone uh, where enemies can get you. But once you're at the destination, pop that. Flag yourself exempt from fleet warp. And then, if you see that your fleet warping off, obviously warp off yourself. You'll want to make a safe beforehand, and we'll talk about that in a moment, too. But you warp off when, the, when your, your fleet warps off, because you don't want to be sitting there, you know, all by yourself. And then when you see your fleet warp back in, you warp back in at the appropriate distance from your fleet. Um, you'll probably even have a second safe you might have set up, but more likely that's not going to be what you want to warp to. Um, what I usually do, you know, almost always you're going to want to have your FC um, in your watch list. So this is where it becomes important to know your optimal, know your ranges, and we'll talk about that a little more. You warp in at 50, 60, 30, whatever distance from your primary fleet. And that way you are that far away from the enemy fleet. And that puts you in a better position. Uh, avoid bubbles. Um, your main defense when you're targeted is just to warp off. If you're in a bubble, you can't warp off. Unless the FC tells you to get in a bubble, you should never be in one. Um, keeping range, kind of we've, all, we've been talking about that over the whole thing. If you get yellow boxed, yellow box means they're targeting you. Red box means they're shooting you. If they get to the point where you're red boxed, you're probably dead. If you see enemies yellow boxing your ship, warp off and then warp back. All that happens, that pulls you out of the sight, out of the fight for, you know, five, ten seconds. If you get blown up, you're out of the fight until you can either get all the way back in a new ship or possibly permanently, depending on how far away you are from, from the action. Now, this is where I talked about knowing your optimal. If any of you are in an E-War ship right now, and actually almost any ship you can be in, anything that's in the top turrets, the top uh, slots uh, of your ship, if you highlight it, will almost always have a range involved. Even if you're in a mining ship right now, you can highlight the miner, the, the strip miner or the, the miner one or whatever you have fit to it. And it will tell you range within such and such KM or uh, now... If you have a gun, if you have an E-War module or anything like that, it will say optimal range and max range, basically. You want to be between those two. Don't worry about trying to always be within optimal range. Uh, being within optimal range makes a huge difference for DPS. doesn't make as big of a difference for E-War. gives you a little bit, but it's not enough to matter. And if you're in that op, if you're inside of the optimal range, you're probably too close to the enemy. But that maximum range, if you're between that and your optimal, that's kind of the sweet spot. That's where you want to be as an as a uh, an E-War ship. The reason it's important to know this is everything I just told you beforehand of how to handle yourself in a fleet, where to be on the, the grid, you know, how to keep the right distances, all depends on that range. You need to know that range. If you know, and this is where you also want to be paying attention to what the DPS your ship your, your your fleet is trying to keep at. If you know that your FC is trying to keep at 30 km away from the enemies, then you're probably going to want to keep 60 km away or 70. 
and that's just kind of something you'll learn as you go. It takes it's, it's, it makes a lot more sense once you've actually been in a couple fleets and doing it. Um, if you're in Horde, your first couple fleets, you're going to go in um, in an NBI wing or an EWAR wing, and you'll be able to anchor on someone. Um, we'll, we'll teach you what, what we're doing and tell you what's happening, and you'll get the feel of it so you're not just trying to come out and immediately do that. Uh, but once you get those couple of practices in there, that's when you can start going, all right, I'm going to – I don't have to be with the anchor. I don't have to be right on top of them. I can put myself in the best position on the field and make myself useful, and I don't have to, you know, you know, I know how to what to pay attention to and what's important. So, just to kind of refresh on that, most important is knowing where the enemy fleet is, <laughs> where your fleet is, avoiding bubbles, and keeping somewhere beyond your optimal range, but within your max range. So, if your max range is 101 and your optimal is 60, you want to be somewhere around 80 usually. If you know the enemy ships are hitting at nine, hitting and locking you up, anytime you're at 60 km of them, then go to 70. If they are still locking you up, go to 80. That type of thing right there. That's what you want to do. Keeping yourself the right distance from your targets is what matters the most. And last but not least, and very, very important, if someone yellow boxes you, warp away. Uh, now, I said we talk about making safes. If you've never done this, what happens is if you are in warp somewhere or sitting somewhere stopped and you hit control B on your keyboard while in space, it will open up a window. It will give you a little thing that you can type in, um, but if you don't type anything there, it will say spot in such and such system. Um, my trick for this is to just use numbers because usually I'll be making a lot of safes when I'm doing something. Um, so. The first one I make, I'll type a 1 and hit enter. The second one I make, I'll hit a 2 and hit enter. Uh, an important thing and distinction here, when you are creating a safe, when you're saving a spot that you can warp to in space, which is what you're doing when you're doing this control B, it saves your location when you hit the enter key, not when you've hit control space. So you hit control space. When you're at that spot you want to be, you can hit enter. That's where you've created that space. And you can do it and warp. This is a really useful thing to do, you know, if you're going to a structure bash and you know, hey, the FC is warping the fleet to that structure, about halfway there, a quarter of the way there, three quarters of the way there, something like that, hit control B and make a safe. That is a place you can warp to that, you know, you're not trying to warp to a structure or a planet or something that the enemy fleet can, or people in the enemy fleet can go, oh, hey, that's where they warp. You're warping to just some random space, random place in space a lot harder to find you in. And then when the fleet warps back, you can warp back to the fleet. You can also, if the fleet warps away in an engagement, warp to the FC, and then when they warp back in, warp in at the right distance from the FC. That way you're coming in kind of the same direction. But having safes is always a useful thing. Um, it's actually been, I've seen it used in fleets where someone who had created a safe um, that was in an E-war. The FC was like, crap, I need a safe, because they were scanning everybody down. And that he would have said, hey, I'm at my safe. And the fleet warped to him. And that stopped them from getting caught in a bad position. So safes are super useful all the way around. Definitely make sure you're making them when you're in hostile space, especially. Uh, if you like to respond to, uh, in Horde, what we call Ws, uh, meaning that someone is, if you W up in fleet, that means someone has you tackled and you need help. If you like to respond to those, having safes can be very useful for that too, especially in and around um, our gates. And that's the same for anybody in any corporation. If you're in a place where you're responding to or helping your buddies, um, having safes in the area can be very useful um, to let you warp in and see the target. Uh, another tactic that we should definitely talk about in responding to standing fleet Ws or helping people who have been tackled in your space, don't ever warp in at zero in an E-War. If you're in an E-War frigate, you warp in at 30, at 60, at 50, at something along those range, lines. You've got massive range. You don't need to be right on top of whatever's there. You let you warp in, lock up whatever's on your buddy, and apply your log, your, your E-War. Uh, okay. Ugh, need a breath for a moment. Sorry, guys. Um, trying to get it all done within the hour. We're doing pretty good. We got about nine minutes to go, and then um, I'll leave the 
the com the mumble comms and um, and I'll be watching in in the Twitch stream for people to ask questions. But now we're gonna talk about the priorities of each specific ship. For a crucifier, it's simple. Like we said earlier, you can only affect enemy DPS, so you should be affecting enemy DPS. Um, now, uh, Ewar does have diminishing returns, so you don't want to be putting everything on one, um, especially you know if you have 30 crucifiers and they're all affecting one ship. Well, that one ship can't do squat, but all the rest of them can. Um, in a crucifier or a griffin. A Mollus, a Vigil, pretty much anything, unless the FC tells you otherwise, you are splitting your modules. You're affecting as many enemies as possible. Uh, Crucifiers have three usually fit to them, so you're going to target three different ships. Uh, the best way that it's done, if you aren't given specific targets, is pick three people whose names are closest to yours on the enemy DPS list and start dampening them. Start, start disrupting them, sorry. Um, uh, trying to think here. There's something else I wanted to make sure I included here, and my brain just ran away without me. Always fun. Uh, so when choosing who you're targeting, of course, this can be important, and how do you keep that separate? Most of the times, if you're flying in E-War, once you're actually t actively in engagement, you're going to want to use a tab that has just ships on it. Probably just enemy ships. Um... Yeah, just enemy ships as you were. You can sort that by ship type. So if you're fighting a group of enemies that are flying typhoons with scythe logistics, you can know, okay, I don't want to target anybody in a scythe. They're, they're doing um, logistics, so hitting them doesn't do me any good. So typhoons are what I want to look at. Anybody whose names are close to mine in typhoons, okay, there's your three. Boom, boom, boom. That's who I want. And you stay on them. Uh, griffins and molluses are very different. Uh, your general primary target in those two is going to be enemy logistics first, DPS, or enemy E-War second. Um, and the reason being is if you can disrupt enemy logistics, you shut down the fight. You, you, they can't repair and you can. If your, your guys are being repaired and their guys aren't, um, you win. <laughs> Pretty simple. Even if you're just delaying how fast they can get those um, reps onto their enemies, that can be a different, big difference. Now, the Griffin is a little unique in how you apply it. Um, if you are ever in a situation where you only have one enemy in range, so you're applying all three of your, your jammers to that one enemy, don't apply them all at the same time. Because if... I hit, let's say I target somebody and I get lock, and then I hit F1, F2, F3, because that's where I've moved my my jams to. I've applied all three of them, and if only one of them is successful, then I have jammed them for 30 seconds. If all three of them are successful, I've jammed them for 30 seconds. It doesn't make any difference. But if you stagger them, so I hit the first, I activate the first one on the guy. I wait five seconds and activate the second one. I wait five seconds to activate the third one. Now, if only one applies, he's jammed for 30 seconds. If two of them apply, he's jammed for 35 seconds. If all three of them apply, he's jammed for 40 seconds. And one of my and your the cycle on your jams is 30 seconds too. So, if I've spread them out like that and, and given them different amounts of time. One of them is done while another is still applying to the enemy, and I can start the other one back up. And you can actually get someone in a it, – it's difficult to get that lucky, but it is possible to perma-jam someone with one single griffin. Yes, Marchog is exactly right. This is where, you know, when you're doing responding to, to Ws or standing fleets or – Helping buddies. If you're not in a big fleet and you're not fighting a bunch of enemies, it's much better to put all three things on one. Um, if you're in the vigil, you put all three, you know, all, or two, or however many uh, target painters you have on that one target. If you're in a mollusk, you put all three on whatever's tackling your buddy. Uh, Griffin, whatever's tackling your buddy. 
Because if you stop the guy who's tackling, your buddy can get out free and clear. If they get out, you get out, unless you have you know more DPS on grid and you're going to take out the bad guys. Um, vigils, your primary target is DFC's primary target 90% of the time, unless there are a whole bunch of you in the fleet, and then you're going to do the same thing as the others, spread it out amongst um, people whose names are near to yours. Um, if, let's say you only have five uh, vigils in the fleet, well, you still don't need 10 target painters on the primary. So you put one of your target painters on the primary target and a second one on an enemy logistics or another DPS. Um, again, you're sowing confusion with that second one. You're, you're making them have to pay attention to more than one spot. And an FC can see if someone's target painted, and they can go, oh, well, that's a better target. Everybody on that. So... Just an idea there, something to pay to pay attention to. Um, now this last will depend on you know what fleet you're in, who you're with, so on and so forth. But when you're in doubt on any of this stuff, ask the EWAR FC. Hey, you know what are we doing here? What are the, the wing commander? And you don't want to be pestering the the main FC in the middle of a fight about what to do as an EWAR because he's got a lot going on. But if you have an NBI or if you have an EWAR wing commander. That's who you can can say, hey, you know, do you want me to focus on these these logi over here, or um, what would you like me to do? And that's that. The last thing that you do, and this is a priority of all Ewar, as most especially the Mollusks and the Crucifiers, because you can fit more drones. Now, most of the time, you're not going to be able to apply your drones to the enemy DPS because if you're within range of a plot to apply your drones to them, you're in range for them to shoot you. Not what you want. But you are usually close to or near your own logistics ships. And if your logistics ships are being hazed by light tackle or enemy E-War, sick those drones on, on whatever is messing with them right away. This is a tertiary responsibility. So if you're not comfortable yet with your primary stuff that you're supposed to be doing, don't worry about it. Don't focus on it. It's a tactic and a strategy that you use when you are comfortable doing everything else and going, oh, okay. I, I can now add this as, a, as another thing that I can watch for, pay attention to, and do. And it will make a difference, especially with, for example, the Crucifiers and Mollusks, because you can carry nine and six drones um, separately. But even in a Griffin or Vigil with your one little drone, well, what if there's 20 of you? That's 20 little drones. And 20 little drones on an enemy E-War that's trying to jam your, your logistics ships will pop it. It'll take it out. Or a, a light tackle that's trying to hold your logi in place so the enemy fleet can warp in on it. Those drones can save them. Really something to pay attention to and very useful once you are comfortable flying anymore in every other aspect of it. Again, this is kind of the last thing that you want to be doing um, once you are comfortable with everything else. But once you are comfortable with everything else, it can make a huge difference in fights. Um, you can also use it to haze off enemy drones or enemy fighters. Um, because those are most likely in on your team's DPS, and they will be within range of you. Do you get KMs for killing enemy drones? No. But do you win the fight more likely because you took out the enemy drones? Yes. <laughs> and this is just a way that you can be even more impactful in that in that you are once you're comfortable with your your primary role. Uh, that is pretty much it. My name is Thelzar Kalzahar. I really like when people come. I really enjoy doing these classes. Um, the other name you see on here is the Mighty Quim. She is the one who made the slideshow as awesome as it is. I had done a very basic one that was pretty simple and not as cool looking. And she came back and just made it amazing. I always give her props at the end of these classes because she took her time to do that. And I think it's very useful and very awesome. So want to give her props. Can't take credit for the really cool slideshow when she's the one who did all the work on it. <laughs> uh, now we have open classes. Um, so our open questions, sorry. Anyone, if you have a question, throw it up in Twitch chat. Um, you can mention it on Mumble if you're in there, or you can ask in Fleet Chat. Um, Fleet Chat's a little hard for me to look at right now, so better to do Twitch or Mumble. 